Hello there, my fellow faith seekers, and welcome to the next chapter in the Saga of Lorgar, aka the Urizen. This time, episode number 5. Having finished talking about the Primarch's pilgrimage last time, today I wanted to bring to your attention a few actions and events that he took part in during the Horus Heresy, prior to his Shadow Crusade. We will mention what happened to him on Istvan V, as well as several interactions and meaningful conversations with Magnus the Red and the demon-possessed Fulgrim. I am your host, the Grim Dark Narrator, and without further ado, let us see what happened to Lorgar next, shall we? I talked in more detail about Lorgar's pilgrimage during the last two videos, but for the new viewers, here's a quick reminder of the overall beginning of the heresy for the word bearers. It was the castigation on Ke that ultimately turned the word bearers into the servants of chaos. While Lorgar brooded over the Emperor's reproach, Corfairon, his trusted lieutenant and closest friend, whispered to Lorgar of the great chaos gods beings that welcomed, even demanded, zealous worship and devotion, unlike the Emperor who was clearly not divine, if he refused to accept rightful worship. Lorgar was slowly poisoned against the Emperor by Kor Feyron, who was appointed Master of the Faith and was tasked with converting the entire Legion to the worship of Chaos. The word bearers came to venerate the dark powers, but instead of throwing their support to one god, they worshipped Chaos Undivided, a pantheon composed of all the ruinous powers. It was Lorgar and the word bearers who ultimately converted the Warmaster Horus to the worship of Chaos, by introducing his legion, the then Luna Wolves, to the Warrior Lodges, which were picked up from the world of Davin. Later, in a plot involving the word-bearer chaplain Erebus, Horus was manipulated to return to Davin, where he could be wounded and in that poison state prove more malleable to the corruption by chaos. The Legion kept their new devotion secret, until the Warmaster Horus declared his own faith in chaos, and began the galactic civil war known as the Horus Heresy. The word bearers quickly joined the rebellion, and many of the worlds they had conquered since their conversion turned as well, having been corrupted by the word bearers to their new faith in chaos during their conquest. Which brings us to the Dropsite Massacre on Istvan V. Now, we talked about Istvan V from the perspective of at least three Primarchs by now, and believe it or not, we will talk about it again at least once more. However, there isn't much to be reset for this fourth time. Long story short, the traitor legions actually numbered seven, and not three like the loyalists initially believed. So when the Iron Hands, the Salamanders, and the Raven Guard legions attacked the lines of Horus, they were sandwiched and almost destroyed when the other four made landing, aka the Alpha Legion, the Word Bearers, the Night Lords, and the Iron Warriors. So, with that explained in a nutshell, let's also go briefly over Lorgar's fight with Korax. The Raven Lord charged into the ranks of the treacherous word bearers, a blur of charcoal armor and black blades butchering with an ease that belied his ferocity. Soon, the voices of dying word bearers became a conflicting chorus over the Vox, as they screamed for help. Argel Tal, leader of the demon-possessed Astartes, known as the Galvor Bak, Lorgar's blessed sons, leapt forward to meet their end at the hands of the demigod. Meanwhile, Lorgar mirrored his brother's actions, and slaughtered many Astartes with contemptuous ease. Just as the word bearers struggled to stand before Korax, so too did the Raven Guard fall back and die in droves. Suddenly, the Urizen halted his attack. He noticed that Korax was wading through the Galvor Bak, ripping his demon-possessed warriors apart. Given a blessed respite from the Primarch's murderous advance, the Raven Guard were falling back from him in a black tide. 
Despite the protestations of both Corfairon and Erebus, Lorgars sprinted forwards across the churned earth and dead bodies of his brother's legion to engage in a battle he had no hope of winning. He saw his brother, a man he had barely spoken to in two centuries of life, a man he barely knew, butchering his sons in a vicious rage. There was no thought of conversion, no hope of bringing Korax into the fold, or enlightening him enough to cease this murderous rampage. Lorgar's own anger rose to the fore, burning away the passionless killing of only moments ago. As the word-bearer's Primarch hammered his way through the Raven Guard to reach his brother, he felt power seething inside him, aching to rise out. Always, Lorgar had bitten back his psychic power, hiding it and hating it in equal measure. It was unreliable, erratic, unstable, and painful. It was never the gift it seemed to be for Magnus, and thus he had swallowed it back, walling it back behind unyielding resolve. But no more. A scream of release tore itself free, not from his mouth, but his mind. It echoed across the battlefield, and it echoed into the void. Energy sparked from his armor, and a sixth sense unrestrained at last, with its purity perhaps colored by chaos, exhaled from his core. Lorgar felt the heat of his own fury made manifest. He felt his unchained power reaching out, not only to enhance his physical form, but reaching to his sons across the battlefield. And there he stood at the heart of the killing fields, winged and haloed by amorphous contrails of psychic fire, shouting his brother's name into the storm. Meanwhile, the Primarchs fought in furious combat, Korax fighting to kill, while Lorgar just fighting to stay alive. During their duel, Korax hurled insults and accusations at his former brother. He wanted to know why Lorgar and the Legion had committed such atrocities. Lorgar shared with his brother of the future visions he had seen of their father, a bloodless corpse enthroned upon a throne of gold and screaming into the void forever. Angered by his brother's words, Korax lashed out furiously with his lightning claws across Lorgar's face, cutting the meat of his cheeks deeply. Even should Lorgar somehow survive this day, he would bear those scars forever. The two Primarchs traded vicious blows, but the Raven Lord had the advantage of not only speed and finesse, but also decades of fighting experience. You see, kids, that's what happens when you pit a Bible thumper against an actual warrior. Lorgar did not have the veterancy of Korax, for he had always been a scholar and not a warrior, and his lack of experience was starting to cost him dearly, as Korax impaled Lorgar through his stomach. The claws bit and cut, sowing through the word-bearer's body. Illuminarum, Lorgar's famous mace, slipped from the impaled Primarch's fists. Those same hands wrapped around Korax's throat, even as the Raven Lord was carving his brother in half. Lorgar crashed his forehead into Korax's face, shattering his brother's nose, but still he couldn't free himself. The Raven Lord gave no sound, even as a second, a third, and a fourth headbutt decimated his avian features. Lorgar fell to his knees, hands clutched over the ruination of his stomach. As Korax stepped closer, he raised his one remaining claw to execute his brother. Lorgar screamed defiance at Korax, lost in the irony that of all the sons of the Emperor, he was the one soul in twenty who never wanted to be a soldier. And now, here he would die, at the heart of a battlefield struck down by such a warrior. However, as the claw fell, it struck opposing metal. Another psycho, Conrad Kurz of the Night Lords, had come to save a brother. Being in a tactically unsound position, and with the Raven Guard retreating, Korax saw there was no way but to retreat. Afterwards, Lorgar thanked his brother for saving his life, but Kurz warned him that he would let him die the next time. His next words halted as he took in the scene of the transformed Galvor Bach, 
Their armor was crimson and ridged bone. Great claws, both metallic weapons and fleshy jointed talons, extended from bestial arms. Disgusted by this horrific sight, Curz turned his back on Lorgar, and commented that he was much more than merely foul, he was rancid with corruption. Though grievously wounded, Lorgar would live. The traitors had carried the day and dealt the Emperor a crippling blow. Following this, there was a conclave of most of the traitor Primarchs aboard Horus's flagship, the Vengeful Spirit. I talked about it before, but I still wanted to mention the incident, where Lorgar realized Fulgrim was possessed by a demon at that point. Horus diffused the situation, however, and Lorgar went back to his flagship, the Fidelitas Lex. Aboard Lorgar's flagship, the Primarch was visited by a projected phantasm of his brother Magnus the Red, composed of silver witchfire. The Red Cyclops wanted to discuss some urgent matters in private. The Thousand Suns Primarch was trying to gauge his brother's reactions in light of recent events, as well as the kinds of fate that all seemed to be converging towards Lorgar. Lorgar explained that he had seen the truth on the very pilgrimage his brother had demanded he never make. After Istvan V, a veil had been lifted. There was no longer any need to hold back, for if they restrained themselves, they would lose the war, and humanity would lose its only chance of enlightenment. The Crimson King cautioned Lorgar against the careless and blatant use of his psychic abilities, in such a primitive and brutal manner, for he was inviting the presence of very dangerous warp entities into their midst. Lorgar brushed off his brother's advice and retorted that his opinion on the matter was moot, since he had delved too deeply into the powers of the Immaterium and brought down the wrath of the wolves upon his homeworld. He was now a lord of a treacherous legion that had been damned in the eyes of their brother legions and only stood on the side of the war master because they were exiles. Because why listen to a guy with decades of experience working with the Immaterium when you have Papa Corfaeron whispering sweet bullshit into your ear? Lorgar revealed to Magnus that since his abilities had grown more powerful, he had been able to delve deeply into the skies of fate, both past and future. He forewarned Magnus that the Legion was not free of the flesh change his Legion had once so feared. Lorgar warned him to beware those among his sons that failed to embrace it as the gift that it was. The Crimson King then decided to change the subject, and began talking of their brother Fulgrim and the terrible fate that had befallen him. Lorgar then chastised his brother Magnus for not telling him the truth five decades earlier and for trying to keep him away from his pilgrimage, where he finally discovered the truth about the Primordial Annihilator and the other things he had discovered since then. Magnus claimed he had only done this to protect Lorgar from his self-righteous certainty and arrogance in his beliefs. The Urizen tersely replied that he stood at the right hand of the new emperor, commanding the second largest legion of the Imperium while Magnus was a broken soul, leading a shattered legion. Perhaps he hadn't been the one that needed protection, or the one whose arrogance led to his downfall. Magnus could not claim the same, for they both knew the truth, but only one of them had faced it. Lorgar grew angry, calling Magnus a coward for knowing the primordial truth, yet failing to embrace it. Chaos was only grotesque because they had only seen it with mortal eyes, but when they ascended, they would be the chosen children of the gods. Magnus interrupted his brother's diatribe, lashing out angrily with his psychic ability. The Crimson King had grown weary of Lorgar's petty banter. Magnus challenged his brother that if he knew the truths beyond their reality, then to show him tell him what he had seen at the end of his accursed pilgrimage. Lorgar told his brother of everything that occurred many decades ago. The Crimson King knew that what his brother had spoken of was true, but one lingering question remained. 
Would Lorgar face their brother Gilliman at Kalf? The irisant response was enigmatic, as he explained to Magnus that some of his word bearers would indeed go to Kalf, while some would not. He would only reveal his plans to the Red Cyclops when he had committed fully to the War Master and his cause. Following their private exchange, Lorgar once again attended the War Master upon the Vengeful Spirit, this time in the company of Angron, Primarch of the World Eaters. When he inquired to Horus what was to befall their brother Fulgrim, the War Master brushed off Lorgar's inquiry. Enraged, Lorgar refused to follow Horus' plans for his legion, instead informing the War Master of his intentions to follow a plan he had concocted earlier, to take the bulk of the legion to the Galactic East, to the realm of Ultramar. The War Master informed his brother that they had argued over this proposed plan many times over, pointing out that if Lorgar split his forces as planned, they would not have enough Astartes to achieve what he proposed. Lorgar angrily retorted that his apostles were prepared to sail into Ultramar. They had made pacts with divine forces that Horus still struggled to comprehend. Demons of the warp would answer their summons. The War Master pointed out that Lorgar needed legionaries and not demons. Lorgar retorted that perhaps Horus should lend him a few of his companies, to accompany him to the East. Horus promised his brother that he would give him much more than that. He would give him another legion. Thus, only one last order of business remained. Lorgar traveled down to the surface of Istvan V to seek out and confront Fulgrim. When the demon Fulgrim tried to forestall Lorgar, at a signal his legionaries of the 17th teleported aboard 49 Emperor's Children vessels holding their commanders hostage at gunpoint. Now that Lorgar had made a point, he wanted to speak to the Demon Fulgrim alone. The Demon Fulgrim took Lorgar aboard the 3rd Legion flagship, Pride of the Emperor. Lorgar was escorted to La Fenice, the former lounge and theater of the Remembrancers of the 28th Expeditionary Fleet, where the Emperor's children had undergone their final apotheosis as true servants of Slanesh. Lorgar regarded the devastated theater. Whatever last performance had taken place here had been one of supreme decadence. Bodies, already gone to rags and bones, slumbered in cadaverous repose across chairs and aisles. Discarded weapons and broken furniture lay strewn across the scene. Nothing was unmarked by the black stain of blood. The demon Fulgrim led Lorgar to the stage and gestured behind a thick silk curtain, revealing an exquisite portrait of the Phoenician. The demon Fulgrim explained that he had upheld his end of the bargain, for Lorgar had now seen his wayward brother. Thinking himself being mocked, Lorgar reached for his Crozius, threatening violence. The demon Fulgrim told the word-bearer's Primarch to look closely at the painting, and he would see the truth. This time he let his eyes slip across the image, seeking no details, merely drifting until they rested where they may. He met the image's soulfully rendered eyes, and at last Lorgar breathed through the faintest of smiles and greeted his brother. The demon asked if Lorgar saw the truth. Lorgar replied that he saw more than the demon realized. Facing his brother's captor, he informed the Neverborn that if he thought to relish all of eternity playing puppeteer to his brother's body, then he would find himself fatally disappointed one night. The demon said that the Urizen spoke with the lies of a desperate and foolish soul. Lorgar merely laughed and smiled at the demon sincerely, replying that the creature's secret was safe with him, and to enjoy his stewardship while it lasted. Returning to the Fidelitas Lex, Lorgar convened the Council of Sanctity to speak once more of his plans for Calf. Then, in the hours that followed, he summoned Argel Tal and his most trusted sub-commanders to speak of other, more secretive plans. 
for Lorgar's most trusted son, like him, had other wars to fight even as the Calf system would burn. And that, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about Lorgar and his journey for today. What are your thoughts of his clash of ideas with Magnus? Do you think he was right, or was Magnus right? Let us know and discuss in the comments below. Was this video informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for more content. Thank you very much for watching, and I wish you all a great day. The Emperor Protects.